is we want to make it as difficult as we can and put as many hurdles and roadblocks in between the hacker and the money as we can. But this really is, yes, you need a firewall on your network. Yes, you need antivirus and anti-spam and you need to patch your stuff. Those are all kind of basic rules of the road stuff that if you're doing, you can rely on the larger companies like Microsoft and Cisco to be watching out for the complex hacking scenarios. What we need to be doing individually as business owners and as HR folks is to be specifically addressing how the business email compromise will, cha will affect the end user. Good morning, HR. I'm Mike Coffey, and this is the podcast where I talk to business leaders about bringing people together to create value for shareholders, customers, and the community. Please follow, rate, and review Good Morning HR on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or at goodmorninghr.com. The 1983 movie War Games introduced the concept of hacking to the general public. And in the ensuing four decades, we've seen massive online breaches of security involving both personal and business information. Once considered a unique event, data breaches have become commonplace, but many companies still don't have adequate safeguards to protect their information. Our guest today says that protecting businesses' computer networks and information involves both technological and human defenses. Gary Tonages is an entrepreneur, certified public accountant, and owner of TriQuest Technologies, a Fort Worth-based IT solutions provider. He will be presenting about how to mitigate the cybersecurity risks facing businesses at Fort Worth HR's Strategic Mindset Conference on, September, on September 17th. Welcome to Good Morning HR, Gary. Thank you, Mike. So how serious is this data breach problem? Well, it's it's been, if you measured the seriousness of it by the dollars of the impact that the insurance, the insurance companies are reporting, the losses have gone from several hundred million dollars 10 years ago to this year, $1.9 billion is reported Aye. by the FBI in the, in the year 2020 for email based attacks. So the, the dollars are huge and they're getting bigger. And so if you use that as a, as a benchmark, I think, I think it's twice as risky this, this year as it was last year. But each year, it seems like we solve one problem and another one crops up. The bad guys are always one step up ahead of us. Well, they're making a tremendous amount of money doing cybercrime. And in that world, they're, that, they're reinvesting that money in their tools and their processes. And just like we invest in our businesses to make our businesses stronger and be able to ship more products with the same number of labor and that kind of thing, they're automate, they're buying tools to automate, they're hiring programmers to write more sophisticated tools, they're using the internet to share information so that they can take an untrained uh, criminal and train them up to be able to do more faster. They even have call centers. Wow. And so, yeah, I've, I've received those calls from Microsoft who want to help me uh, install an update that's critical and... Uh, I've uh, I've played along with him and even recorded one for and kept the guy on the line for about forty minutes before he finally hung up on me. I never did give him access to the computers. My IT guys have beat that into my head. Good, but Good. we hear about these giant breaches. You know, major consumer reporting agencies, major government entities, things like that. If I'm a small business, maybe I have 30, 40 employees, or five or six. How, how much do I need to be worried about? I mean, are they really going to target a smaller business or is this just something that big businesses worry about? Well, that's a great point. And in, in your intro, you referenced the, the War Games movie, which was a, was a great show. And unfortunately, or fortunately, that's not the people, that's not what is the risk that small businesses need to be aware of. Tar the Target breach where they stole all the credit cards, the Experian breach where they stole everybody's uh, email addresses just re and social security numbers. Just recently, the hackers went after T-Mobile and 
was able to, I, I think they downloaded 100 million records. There's only 170, 107 million T-Mobile customers. So basically the entire customer base, all their credit information, everything that T-Mobile was in custody of is out on the dark web for criminals to utilize. So you can pretty much bet that all our what we consider to be private or confidential information, it's personal stuff, is is out there somewhere through one of these larger data breaches. That's not really what we're concerned about. So wh- one of the things that we counsel our customers to focus on is, is effective cybersecurity, which brings in the concept of risk mitigation. So what is the largest risk that faces that you will face if you're a 30 person company, 40 person company doing 25, $30 million worth of revenue every year. If you're in manufacturing, who's coming after you and in what ways are they going to try to monetize that attack? Because the criminal wants to make money. That's their goal. And they're going to do that in one of two ways, either by tricking you as you referenced people calling and saying they're with Microsoft, let me into your computer. And where that ends is rerouting of financial information. So you wire, you think you're paying a vendor and you're actually wiring it to to the criminal organization, Mm -hmm. or they lock your system down either through what the software called ransomware, which is a software program that one way or another, they, they get installed on your computer and it locks it up so that you can't use it until you pay some sort of a, a ransom. To, to get the data back or get the system back. And that, that's something that a lot of small businesses get caught by is that they don't realize how important some of the secondary systems that reference technology or use technology in their business. So let's say, for example, you are a small business that ships once a week. Every Thursday, your orders go out. Well, that shipping computer that prints the UPS labels doesn't really have any data on it that you care about. So you don't even back it up. So it gets hit with ransomware. Well, what does that do to the business? So they didn't hijack your data. They hijacked your ability to print UPS labels, which downstream in the process means you can't ship, which means that two weeks later, you're going to feel that in your accounts payable stream because you're not going to have revenue for that period. And so the larger the scale gets, the worse the impact can be. And 85% of small businesses that get hit with these large scale ransomware attacks never recover. Wow. There's, there's a big, big number of companies that get hit with a, a full a, attack of ransomware where the system is hijacked and they never, they never come back because it's that devastating. So what are the most common ways that something like ransomware gets on somebody's computer or on their network? Well, it's interesting. One of the reasons that I was excited to talk to you and to HR folks is that it's the people. Of course. 85% of all inbound attacks start with the email mechanism. That's the conduit for how they come in. And then it's human beings, typically, like you referenced the uh, Microsoft scam, which is a which is a, a confidence scam where someone pretends to be from a trusted source like Microsoft or an Amazon customer service representative or your cable company or AT&T. And they say, you, we noticed that you've got a problem on your computer and we are concerned about you. We want to log in and help you. And uh, I was able to fix it. And what they're actually doing is putting probes on your system that allow them to remotely access it later, upload all your data, and then use your computer as the origination for other attacks. Right. So are these emails, I mean, we've all seen the Nigerian emails where, you know, I'm a, a prince in Nigeria. Are they that obvious or? No, that okay. that was, as I, we were talking about how the criminals have reinvested in their, their systems, th- they have gotten a lot more sophisticated and they have access to a lot more data than they did back then. So the night, uh, Hey, I'm a Nigerian prince. I've come to America. Can you help me get my money out of this regime to, to, uh, Wells Fargo that worked in 1985 over the telephone. Now people are aware of that and they're aware of the Microsoft scam, but 
this uh, this podcast that we're doing is uh, Zencaster is the software that you're using. Right. If somebody calls your producer and says, I'm with Zencaster, I noticed that you had a problem and let me help tune your audio. Here is a here is a patch that we suggest that you install that it's not going to be released till till later. Would would they install it? Hmm. Would they verify it? Okay. okay, Rob, my producer is is shaking his head no, which is comforting. <laughs> yes, but as you as you expand the number of people that interact with technology in an organization, and some of them are new college graduates, some have never been to college, some are some are warehouse workers whose primary focus is to is to pack boxes or to route things through the system paperwork and stuff like that when you get them involved in interacting with email and invoices and inbound receipts and by the way i just got this email from our customer it's from jim who i know i've talked to him many times on the phone and he's telling me the new bank that they just moved offices which i know they moved offices so this makes sense and I do it. Why do I do it? Because I want to be helpful. I don't want to bother my boss. I want to just get things done and move on along. And we've seen, we've seen examples of this, 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 the, I guess the name for this type of, a, of attack, it starts with this is a BEC or a business email compromise. So, so through some mechanism, they are able to look at the Facebook feed of a company or its homepage or the, uh, and send what really would be almost a generic email to get somebody to log in to a fake website, for example, which then gives the criminal somebody's email. Oh. Now they log into the email system as that person. Now they're in the email system and within the email system, they email the CFO and say, by the way, I was just talking to Jim because he they moved. This is their new address. And the CFO sees it as authentic because it technically is authentic because all the systems that are hopefully in place that protect from spam and anti malware and stuff like that, the people have circumvented it. So it's like the old horror movie. The call is coming from inside the yeah. house. Oh, that's very gosh. good. Okay. Yes, that's oh, exactly wow. what I think of that often uh, that. That reference because the systems aren't designed to to watch for that, and these they're they're able to make money. We we would not go out of our way, I don't think, to spend a significant amount of time to 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 make a couple just a couple of hundred dollars each transaction. But but the average the average loss of these these business email compromise, then uh, send me email, send me some email. Uh, I'll go to the store and buy, buy iTunes gift cards, scratch off the back, take a picture of it and email it to me. So they take you for $1,200, $1,500. Those things are not reported very often because people are embarrassed and because there's no, there's really no chance to recover from it. So yeah, law enforcement's you, not going to be you, interested in something that like that right. with that dollar value. I see. But, or the people are just it, embarrassed. It, it's yeah. already embarrassing. It's already lesson learned. You, you know, and I've I've heard lots of stories from folks who say, yes, that happened, and I should have done it. But there's no culture within the organization to value the concept of getting out of your own head and sharing the wisdom of things like that and saying, by the way, everybody, these types of things are happening in the world so that the intern who's just started in marketing hears that that's a, that's a thing that you can't trust what's written. And let's take a quick break. Good morning. HR is brought to you by imperative premium background checks with fast and friendly service. If you're an HRCI or SHRM certified professional, this episode of Good Morning HR has been pre-approved for one half hour of recertification credit. To obtain the recertification information, visit goodmorninghr.com and click on Research Credits. Then select episode 10 and enter the keyword Gary. That's G-A-R-Y. 
On Thursday, September 30th, I'll be hosting a free webinar entitled Beyond Values, Building an Ethical Business Environment. This free webinar is approved for one professional development credit for SHRM certified professionals and one hour of business recertification credit for HRCI certified professionals. You can register for this free webinar at imperativeinfo.com. And if you're listening to this program after September 30th, you can still watch the recording of this webinar, as well as our previous webinars on our website for credit for free. And now, back to my conversation with Gary Tonages. So how do we do that? How do we uh, keep your frontline employee or, heaven forbid, president or owner of the company from, you know, clicking a link or, or, or getting duped by one of those things? So security awareness training is one factor or one one avenue of pre- creating protection. And what we want to do in, in all facets of cybersecurity beyond just the business email compromise is we want to make it as difficult as we can and put as many hurdles and roadblocks in between the hacker and the money as we can. But this really is, yes, you need a firewall on your network. Yes, you need antivirus and anti-spam and you need to patch your stuff. Those are all kind of basic rules of the road stuff that if you're doing, you can rely on the larger companies like Microsoft and Cisco to be watching out for the complex hacking scenarios. What we need to be doing individually as business owners and as HR folks is to be specifically addressing how the business email compromise will cha- will affect the end user. And so security awareness training is one example of a combination of software plus policy where this software tool that you can buy and implement will periodically send emails to all employees as a campaign. If you've ever done anything with marketing or sending out emails, it's very similar to that. So you, the, the folks receive an email and it says, your Amazon credit card's expired, click here to put in your new credit card. And if they click on it, it says you were duped. This is a, this is a phishing email. And we, and here's a five minute training video to watch. So, so that's, that's one facet of it. A second facet of it is the ability for the software to inside of the email programs to allow individual users to to say, I think this is a phishing email and mark it as such. And then the individual users get ranked as being really good at identifying phishing. And if they mark something from a suspicious sender as phishing, it will remove it from all the employees' email boxes. So it's gamifying kind of uh, the security. A little bit. Awareness. And it's yeah. also it's also leveraging. It's making it quick and easy because one of the things with security, it's, it's kind of like a teeter-totter where the more secure you make something, the less convenient it is. The more convenient, the less secure. Well, finding that right balance in, is how, you get to, how do you get the people, win the hearts and minds and get the people to participate in the security program is to make it relatively easy. So if all I have to do is click a button, I think this is phishing, that that in that creates an awareness of this is something that's good. It also creates the opportunity for people to talk about it on a regular basis. So, so things like that would just be an Outlook plug-in of some sort? That's or, exactly or, right. It's yeah. an Outlook plug-in that cool. would, would sit alongside of this. So you have security awareness training, you have threat protection for the email, you have the ability to market as phishing, and then you have password management. Talk about so, that. Yeah. Yeah. Pa- so, password management's interesting because change me one shouldn't be my password. No, no. Oh. And a lot of people will change that in a minute because they don't want to remember what their passwords are. They have one password and they use it in multiple places. And even though the IT industry has been talking for ten years now about have unique passwords, there's still the statistic is fifty five percent of people use one password for all their logins. Wow. So what happens is it, somebody comes to work at a new company and they create their new login into their office email as their, say their password is Christmas, 1993. That's, they use that everywhere. Well, the, the, there's security on the email server to make sure that 
unauthorized attempts get locked out after five times or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the person thinks, well, Christmas 1993, that's pretty complicated. Nobody's going to be able to guess that. But they also used it on their child's soccer team's website sign up for who's bringing oranges on the next game. And that is server was not secure and was hacked. So now they have the person's name and Christmas 1993 as a code to start trying to hack into this person's email. Wow. So, but if we don't want to keep track of all these complex passwords are things like Dashlane or Keeper, those kind of password managers, are those safe? Yes, that's, that's, that's well, if, as long as whichever password manager you are using has a vault as a, a a vault or a a key that only you know mm-hmm. that the trick is if it's stored in the cloud or stored on your computer it needs to be encrypted with AES 256 encryption if it is then that code um <laughs> yeah, so yeah. that yeah so that, just that, really locked down is what you're saying right yes that yeah, okay. that any anybody that has it it will specifically say those letters aes256 okay. okay and that's just that's just mathematically it, it modern computers the the time that it would take to decrypt or to make it to where you could it was in human readable form would would be beyond the lifetime of people uh. and so the cloud services that do that are safe. The, the ones that do not have encryption. So the way that it works is like you put a password in locally and then what's in, what's uploaded to the internet is, is all encrypted. So, but where it, where it helps is that you, if you have 75 different cloud services that you log into, one of which is your company, then you can have 75 different passwords because these services will help facilitate. I'm going to Amazon and it will provide the Amazon login. Now I'm going to the soccer team. I'm providing that soccer team. You can still use generic login and one login for everything for stuff that doesn't matter. But I have found that people have a hard time determining what matters and what doesn't. Hmm. And if somebody is investigating you if, you, if you think about a world in which people, criminals, are actively taking two hours of their day to search everything they can find to build a database about you and your company, who are your direct reports, who are your employees, who are your key vendors, who are your customers, and then they're sending emails into your junior people to try to get them to change the routing of the finance payments, then what information is important and not right right yes so if uh, you know for you know we've got password managers and those are great i've heard for 20 plus years biometrics is coming you'll be you know we're gonna all our logins will be based on our thumbprint or so you know or mission impossible our iris or something where are we on that that seems like that would be really secure right to have just some biometrics, but it doesn't seem like that's happening. So uh, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because what the, to step back from biometrics for just a second, multi-factor authentication is really what that's about. Okay. So multi-factor authentication is something, you know, something you are and something you have. So something, you know, is your password. Okay. By using a password manager, we make the something that you know, more complicated and to guess. Something that you are is your biometrics. Theoretically, my fingerprints are still unique to me. And then something that you have could be my cell phone and the SIM card in it that has a unique number. It could be the location where I'm sitting, that I'm sitting behind a firewall that has a unique address out on the Internet. So any two of those factors, we can also put certificates on your computer so that only a computer with that digital certificate can connect. But multi-factor is definitely mandatory. In fact, in the last six months, I've noticed that insurance companies for cyber insurance, as we're going through the renewal process with our customers, that they're requiring multi-factor. That's that's how important it is as a defense tool. 
So that's what those annoying OTP codes from Amazon are, right? Yes. Like, we're sending, we sent you a text. And I'm, oh, geez. And now it's going to my wife's email because our Amazon account is under her name. And I'm calling her. I need this code and all of that. That's what they're doing. Yes, that's okay. right. That's right. And that's a very good example of where they've improved the security and decreased the convenience. Right. And 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 then at some point, people will stop buying from Amazon because it's 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 literally easier to go buy Walmart and buy buy it because it than it is to order it online because I don't want it, my wife's out of town and I don't want to bother her. Right? right. And then they'll figure that out and they'll figure out a way to make it more convenient but still be secure. Okay, so, so so that that's very much still something that's in motion. Uh, but a lot of small companies don't put that in place, multi-factor, and they see it as onerous or they don't mm -hmm. want to put something on the cell employees cell phones. Right. But but you you, you got to do it. Multi-factor is, I think, mandatory now. So everybody went remote about 18 months ago or a lot of people mm -hmm. did. Everybody who could did. Um, what are the, any, anything unique about security now that, you know, some percentage of our businesses are all operating from people's bedrooms? Well, in this, in the spirit of where's the data, we were already transitioning as a society to identity based. We, we used to be what was considered location based. So you went to the office and all your stuff was there. That's where your computer was. That's where your accounting files were. And we were migrating with cloud services to from on-premise to off-premise or out in the cloud on the internet storage of data in lots of disparate locations. And the identity is what matters. So who I who am I? Can I prove that I'm me when I log into Amazon or when I log into my corporate email? The move from on-premise to off-premise from for a lot of companies that were already cloud-based. The reason we were able to sh make that shift so fast because we were already there. Hmm. A lot of these, a lot of these uh, problems that we have are caused by convenience or laziness or the fact that like email was never intended to be a storage cabinet. Ah, oh, mine is. All right, <laughs> yeah. everybody's is. So. So we, we really value that convenience. And, and as soon as you force somebody to take like, okay, you can only keep 90 days of history in your email. And then that requires you to have another system that they can put in that's as convenient and as, as easy to organize as what you had already. So there's a, the email has a, has a ton of valuable, historical, organizationally relevant information in it. So when the criminal gets into that system, that's a problem. Now, one of the other ways that people get our passwords is through what's called a key logger. So when employees went home, if the corporate parent or the business didn't give the employees a laptop and say, you can only use this laptop to access email, they were using their home computers, which they share with their family members. Yeah, Teenager has yeah. video games on it. Maybe it has antivirus. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it has a key logger on it that records all the keystrokes. So when they log in to the corporate email and type in their password, they're, they're uploading the password to a criminal. Wow. And we had that, we had that happen that that's exact scenario during COVID where a, a bookkeeper was home using the home computer that really was her son's gaming computer and was interacting with email password compromised password then used to log in and as her sent emails to other folks in the accounting department and vendors hmm. yeah oh my goodness. so so this high email hygiene stuff or, or the the idea of being how security awareness does now that we're working remote and we're sharing other equipment as the, the IT departments, IT companies that oversee this need to be looking at from a remote location, what are they accessing and how do I verify their identity? Okay. So I drink easily two gallons of coffee a day, often at Starbucks. Um, and I pull out my Surface, jump on the Wi-Fi at Starbucks. Any concerns there with just using those open networks? 
there's there are there are some security people that have a big problem with that with me i i don't see it as a big risk um there's a few you're going to come across that in hotels and Mm -hmm. things like that now i can tell you that personally i tend to just use my cell phone data plan as a hotspot okay because that's more secure Okay. And I just don't, it's only in a pinch that I would use the, the Starbucks or the hotel, whatever. But, but sometimes I do. And the, the reason that it's not a big deal is that because everything is now running inside of an encrypted channel. So when you, when you open a browser and it's got the little lock mm-hmm. up on top and it says HTTPS, right. that the anybody that would be sitting next to you watching what you're doing, they might be able to see your machine name. They might be able to see your Mac address to identify that you were there and they might be able to see that you're going to Amazon, but they don't have any ability to see inside that, that data channel. So what difference does it make? It's so, kind of my attitude. So when I'm uploading my latest only fans video uh, from Starbucks, I'm safe. Yes. Sure. Okay, good. That's, Nobody that's else probably- is, but I am. Okay. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have today, Gary. That was a fast 30 minutes. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. You bet. Thank you. And thank you for listening. You can find previous episodes, show notes, and contact info for our guests at goodmorninghr.com or on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And don't forget to follow us wherever you get your podcast. Also, don't forget to register for Fort Worth HR's Strategic Mindset Conference on September 17th. You can do that at fwhr.org. Gary speaking, as am I. So we'll see you there, I hope. And in the meantime, don't forget to follow us wherever you get your podcast. And Rob Upchurch is our technical producer and Imperatives marketing coordinator, Katie Bautista, keeps the trains running on time. And I'm Mike Coffey. As always, don't hesitate to reach out to me if I could be of any service to you personally or professionally. I'll see you next week, and until then, be well, do good, keep your chin up.